You are in for a treat. My guest in today's conversation is founder of Anima Mundi Herbals, Adriana Ayales, who is a wild plant medicine woman who is a business owner, a mama, and we talk about co-creating business with your intuition, with plants, connecting to spirits as a young child and how that connected to what Adriana does today. Manifestation, self-care, so many other beautiful things. You are going to love Adriana. If you don't know about Anima Mundi Herbals yet, it's an online uh, apothecary as well as an offline shop where you can buy all kinds of beautiful wildcrafted botanicals and elixirs. They've got recipes and so much inspiration to help you experience wholeness through connecting to plants. And there's a discount code for all of our viewers and listeners. You can use the code funded by source when you place your order on animamundiherbals.com for 15% off everything. So if there's anything that sparks your heart in this conversation and you want to order it from Anima Mundi, um, we can do so with that code. You'll be supporting the show as well. And as always, you can also listen to this in audio format on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. Enjoy. Adriana, I'm so excited to connect with you. And I was digging into the digital archives of when we first connected. And the very first thread that I could find was in 2017, when whether that was you or someone else from Anima Mundi liked my tweet about me taking a salt bath with essential oils. That was the first interaction no that I found. And yeah. then the one following that was from uh, Rachel Robinette reaching out to me on behalf of Anima Mundi to discuss potentially collaborating also in 2017. And it's been so beautiful to see Anima Mundi be one of those very, very first brands that I heard talking about adaptogens and plant medicine and herbs and rituals around it. And seeing your beautiful jars of just magic potions all over New York City and Brooklyn, opening your own apothecary, and then just blowing up. And on social media, in your business, I see everyone using Yaman Mundi. And it's so beautiful to also see you as this powerful bridge between those indigenous healing modalities and rituals and this modern world and how unapologetically and courageously you have allowed yourself to be a vessel for those things to be discovered in the Western world. So thank you, first of all, for doing what you do. Thank you. That's so sweet. Thank you so much for seeing that and being part of the journey, truly. Mm. So mm -hmm. the journey in this conversation, I want to get both into the rituals uh, with the plants and the products that you bring into the world, um, but also into the business side of it and how you went from being an herbalist to establishing this cult brand that people love so much for a good reason. But before we get there, I want to just rewind back to your childhood when you already were connected to the shamanic gifts that are guiding your life today. And you have shared on your site that at first it felt scary. So take us back to little Adriana growing up on, in Costa Rica and maybe your first interaction with plants or spirits or whichever one wants to jump out. Yeah, it's, it's such a big conversation, but I mean, consolidated, I think it was really powerful to be connected to my grandmother's way of like allowing me to step into meditation at a very young age. We didn't call it meditation. Of course, that's a term that is now very much used. And back then we would just be just sitting in circle in a very profound way, um, invoking spirits. And she would help me as a child, just kind of like understand. I think she saw it in me and just didn't tell me as a, as a kid. I was just like seven years old, just like, let's have a, you know, I would sip her coffee and joke around and eat some cookies. And so, and we would just sit around and she would start doing these profound prayers where I would just naturally want to be in silence and tuning in, you know, so which I think all children have this natural ability because they're in their subconscious mind pretty actively, you know. So I remember just like accessing these very vivid images of what I would see. I would see from like older people to young people and I didn't understand. And then I came to understand those were ancestors that would come to our circles and join us in spirit form. And from her traditions and from the traditions that we, that I've been also learning from in other shamanic cultures, 
not necessarily related to my family, but just it's all about like that connecting to spirit and that sense of prayer to keep an active connection ancestrally. My grandmother was already doing that. So I think she was in a way uh, wanting me to start cultivating it from a young age because she knew it kind of, you know, how it goes from lineage to the grandmother to the grandson or granddaughter, and it kind of gets transferred the energy in that way. So she would explain to me that her gifts were stepping into me and it was important that I started at that age. So I would have very vivid dreams. I would also very oftentimes kind of like lose consciousness and, and not know what I was doing, even though my body was operating and doing things and being with my family. I would have no recollection of where I was or what I was being or who I was. And then I would come back into my body and realize so much had happened that I had no idea. So it happened a few times. And oftentimes it was panic attacks. It was not pretty. As a, as a, you know, under 10 years old, all those years, just kind of adapting to this intense spirit energy. And then I came to work with it just naturally. I think just intu- intuitively, I just felt like there were certain little things that kept me safe and understanding that it was all okay. So it was really key to have her guidance to show me that this was normal, that it's okay, that those are spirits and that's the spirit realm and that's how you work with it and, and access it. And then it was great to also have my mother, was, which wasn't so deeply connected to it but she was very much aware of these realities one way or another. So my parents allowing it obviously was a big game changer growing up into those realities. And then shortly after I started getting really immersed in the healing practices of different things uh, from like Reiki. I started with this wonderful woman when I was like 14, I did my whole Reiki initiation at that time. And then I started working with curanderos, practicing different forms of plant medicine from ayahuasca to plant dietas, which is energetic cleansing to receive and clear your vessel for, you know, spirit messaging and connection to ancestry. It's very powerful. To me, dietas to this day is one of my favorite way of connecting because it involves you sitting with just a particular plant assigned from a curandero or curandera, which means medicine woman and, or man in Spanish. And so they assign you a plant that you cleanse with only, or you're basically just fasting with that plant for 10 days and sometimes a month. And some curanderos do months just of this one plant. Let's say bovinsana is very popular or chuchuasi is another very popular in the jungle, or there's obviously millions of kinds of plants. And so when you're in cleansing that process, you're basically imprinting your energetic field to receive according to that plant's consciousness. It's very profound work. And so I started doing dietas around 18 and so, and just like really falling in love with plants more than what my grandmother actually was. She was more of like a psychic connected medium in a way. And I was more, more of a plant lady. (laughs) I went more into the plant path and it chose me, you know, I never really was like wanting to be an herbalist or wanting to coin myself any of these terms. It was just, I just felt naturally, uh, I don't know, just call to hearing plants. I could hear their voices. I could hear their spirit. I could just understand it, understand plant archetypes and people and how that symbiotic relationship is very symbolic to the formula that's needed at specific times. And so, so yeah, that's where the journey unfolded (laughs) in a very short form, but that's how it unfolded as we, as I navigated to understand that my gift was more with the power of plants more than anything else. So knowing that you are a plant messenger and being connected to that realm so profoundly, at what point did you decide to actually go and study it and get a degree and get the, you know, human labels on top of it? And what did that open up for you? Um, I did it when I was 18, as soon as I left regular schooling uh, or high school. Um, I went to study in Peru for a while with different curanderos. Then I went to California and studied at uh, different centers there, a couple herbal centers. I practiced some clinical herbalism there and a couple clinics. And then uh, I lived in the States for like 10 years about, and then I moved back to Costa Rica to be with my family. And it was around the 2012 time. And I'm like, if this is a crazy ending or beginning of a major cycle, I just felt called to go back to my roots than just living in, in America. And so I went back home and then I got pulled to New York after that to where I studied also with two other mentors and was working at a beautiful retreat center up north in upstate in Ithaca area where there is a lot of like cancer healing and integration. And so working with plants there was wonderful, 
where people do from like enemas to raw vegan food to cleansing to all sorts of things. And there I just fell in love with New York. So I decided not to go back to Costa Rica and continue following botanical path and botanical teachers of North and European mer- medicine. Because I really wanted to dive deeper into North American medicine and Native American medicine, and as well as European botanical alchemy. I really love. So I kind of wanted to keep that on. And I unexpectedly moved to the East Coast. And at that time, I was just like, New York City is the worst place on the planet. I'm never going to live there. You know, I was just, I hated all about the unsustainability as a city, you know. But then as I was living there, I'm like, now I understand why people love this beast. You know, I was just like thrilled with the intensity of energy. And I would hop on the subway and literally just have like these full blown energetic adventures in my mind and in my body and just go so out in my meditation as I was in the subway. So I would be riding the subway and unexpectedly go into these truly transcendental spaces. I was just really connected to the land and I would just feel the energetics of New York as a land as I was there. And it was just really profound and beautiful. I feel like I would go into ancient times in a way and time travel as I meditated on the subway. It was just really profound. And when I started experiencing all those things and connecting to the beautiful different communities of New York City, I felt called to stay there and start my personal practice because it was just kind of drawing me in. Things were just flowing. Everything was just particularly magical, truly. Mm. Um, Wonderful people, situations, things. And so I had my, I got my first apartment in Greenpoint and I just kind of shipped a million herbs from Costa Rica (laughs) to (laughs) to to New York and I just had it stacked to the ceiling. You know, it was just like, as soon as you walked into the room, it was just like, most people would even get headaches from the intense smell of the herbs. You know, it was just like really jungly and, and awesome. So I just started seeing people and it was just wonderful. As a clinical herbalist, I was like doing different procedures from people with chronic diseases to just basic maintenance to all sorts of things. And it was really beautiful. Um, but then I shortly stopped my private practice because it got a little too full. I was a little too busy and and stressing out and I was just not in love with it anymore. I was just kind of a little exhausted and I was like, I want to just continue making medicine, which is what I've always loved. And so I just would make herbal teas and so for different people. And then I started working with little stores at that time. Pure Food and Wine was a great raw vegan restaurant. I would just work with them. And so that was like my first big client in the moment. And I was just all excited at that time. And, and then it just kind of spiraled out from there, just continued. And then we got a little factory and the factory kept growing. And it's been wonderful. The team since the beginning has been like a family. We all produce, you know, with so much love and care, everybody's really in it because they love it. And we're a true familia, we're like working it out, mostly Latino run, you know, we're all Latinos and it's just, it's just fun. You walk in and there's like salsa playing, herbs being bottled. We have like a, <laughs> a Latino rock star playing his music and it's just beautiful. It creates so much community and beauty and that's just the magic of nature, you know, so it's beautifully infused. Mm. And the factory is the back of the shop that you have in Brooklyn, right? Yes. Yeah. We basically expanded into that whole bottom part of the building. That yeah. But we're actually is... looking to leave Brooklyn because it's just very expensive to be in Brooklyn. And so we might be relocating it to upstate New York somewhere. So Ooh, we'll see. Like most yeah. of New Yorkers are, including myself. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You moved to your beautiful tiny cabin. I love that story. Truly. Yes. yes. Being yeah. surrounded by plants, you know, in moments where I feel forgetful or overwhelmed just leaving my office and looking around at the trees, at the birds, at how the plants change every single day, what kind of little frogs or bugs are out. All of that just brings such natural wonder and fascination and this invitation to be back present in my body. I love it. Beautiful. What inspired you actually to move up north? What was the big trigger to move it? Well, Eric has had, my husband has had a dream to uh, have a house in nature for a long time. And he's been visualizing it and imagining it for at least five years before we did it. And I've always connected with nature deeply. And having grown up in Russia, we would spend summers in our country house, which is, you know, a little wooden house in the middle of nature with no running water 
and we would grow our own food and my grandfather and I would go mushroom foraging. And it was this magical time in my life where through the simplicity of being in nature, um, I still carry some of those you know, bits of wisdom from earth with me and still very much. So I find that connecting with mushrooms in various ways, whether that's just admiring them in the forest or communing with them as a plant medicine is my favorite way to connect with my ancestors and with the healing that earth has for us at all times, if we're willing to hear the whispers. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. I love that. And it was, sounds, Russia sounds magical in itself. Yeah. And it was the perfect time, you know, before, uh, all the closings happened in New York city. So yeah, definitely feeling very lucky being in nature and being just held by the trees, you know, and I see these trees behind you. If people are watching this on YouTube, they can see it behind you. It seems like a fake screen, green screen with like superimposed <laughs> trees. It's just this beautiful <laughs> oasis. Um, but that's how exactly how the Anima Mundi Cafe store feels in Brooklyn. It's this oasis in the middle of a busy city where I have been lucky with Eric to lead a crystal workshop. I don't remember if it was once or a couple of times and have just, you know, been in conferences around the corner and would, you know, always find myself stopping by to recharge and have some plant magic there. And Every time I would walk in, the people who work there are just so loving of plants and knowledgeable and, and open and warm. And um, that's what you do. You know, whether people get to visit your storefronts or they just connect with your products, there's something about them that just feels full of miracles. Like somehow, mm -hmm. I don't know what you did, but you've bottled that magic that you've been connected to as a kid. And now people all around the world experience it. So how did you do that? Beautiful. That's so beautiful. Thank you. Truly. It warms my heart so much to hear that. Um, I think, you know, I, it's just so amazing. I feel like how this world is so energetic and it's so profound and everything's about frequency and energy so much more beyond what meets the eye that I think, you know, if you really have that devotion and intention and that like true dharma or true purpose of that you're connecting to this deeper sense of self i feel like that's transmitted into anything that you do and are you know it's like that loving care that you pour into whatever little detail that encompasses your life or your business or whatever you're focusing on if you're really aligned with your purpose it just i believe it translates into the frequency of it and I think ideally that's what it stays that way, you know, kind of like what I was saying when I was working as a, as an herbalist, more one-on-one, -on -one, as soon as I started feeling like I was fading away because I was tired and I wasn't taking care of myself, which happens to all business owners, you know, on whatever level and capacity, if you're not really taking care of yourself, then the frequency gets distorted. And so I really try to really nourish myself as much as possible, even as a mother of two and like running a business and working remotely and from Costa Rica to New York and everything, it's just, it can definitely wear you down. So I'm really happy to hear that's the frequency you emit because it's something I really try to continuously do on a spiritual level to, to connect to the mission and foundation of, of the company and, and the products and integrity that we use. And I think also something that's major is that we work with amazing providers. Like right now, I am so devoted to supporting rainforest traditions more than ever, even though we have herbs from different parts of the world. You know, we have things even from Indonesia and Africa and North America and Europe, you know, there's things coming in from different places, not just local. But I feel like right now I'm so connected to the indigenous people that really produce certain species that are just not easily found in the marketplace. And my intention is for their energy to be preserved. Right now with all the human trafficking, for example, and all these major subjects that are pouring out, you know, indigenous people, they don't have sometimes an option to even dedicate to their craft. Sometimes they don't even have another solution than to work to, to be a rubber tapper for the rubber industry or, you know, cocaine business or whatever is hidden in the, in the Amazon in different parts of South America, for example. And they cannot just be like, oh, I'm going to start wildcrafting, you know, quassia or hergon sacha or all these amazing mulungu, amazing herbs. So by supporting them directly, we're supporting an ancient tradition. It's such a powerful culture and foundation to support that and putting that back into alignment, not have them go to these disgusting businesses that are killing the rainforest. 
you know, so to me, that's really part of the fre frequency to aligning and supporting those kinds of traditions as much as possible. And it's not easy, you know, like they're in the middle of nowhere. It's like, how are you going to get certain herbs through the FDA blanket into the United States? And so it's like, it's a really big deal and it's not easy. It's very complicated. So it, it entails a whole other logistics that's not fun to do for sure. Um, but I think uh, doing that and preserving that frequency and these plants from going extinct or information from going extinct is vital to that resurrection of frequency that is true to ancient traditions and the, the, the now mind that really needs it. I feel like we're all dying to connect to that source in a way because it's been so corrupted. That frequency is very corrupted. So mm. more and more, I, we want to really focus on small farmers and yet get to meet the volumes that we handle and get to preserve it. And if it runs out, it runs out and that's it, you know, like really working. Right now in Costa Rica, for example, my part of my second project that I want to start doing is investing in collectives here. So basically it's like a group of farmers that grow for you and with you. So let's say turmeric, something that we all absolutely love and golden milk and whatever. If we work with a collective of farmers here, it's so much more sustainable than just monocropping the living hell out of a farm and growing, even if it's organically, growing out of alignment to how traditions have grown it in the past. You know, So I think the more we move into that regenerative form of farming, even preserve the frequency of magic. And then hopefully you feel it in the end product, which is obviously a product, but hopefully it is felt and transmitted, as you just said, mm. um, through supporting these old traditions that are so amazing and infused with magic. Mm. Are there particular yeah. rainforest herbs that feel very alive in your daily experience right now? Yes, one that I love that is steeped in tradition is Hergon Sacha, or in, a lot of people in English say Jergon, Jergon Sacha. In Peru, they also call it Sacha Hergon, which is the reverse. Um, but it's such an amazing plant. It literally grows like a fat tuber. It looks like almost spiralish. And then it grows this one long stalk with like the, the flower looking like the head of a snake. And so it looks like a snake like this on the ground, you know? And it's amazing because it's what is used as an anti-venom in the Amazon. So indigenous people consume it raw on the spot if you get bitten by some of the most poisonous snakes. And so after all this amazing scientific research was done on the plant, like in the 80s and 90s, it's known to be a protease inhibitor, like a very strong antiviral plant. So to me, especially with what's happening now, it's my favorite form of antiviral defense. And regardless of the decisions you've done on a medical level, it's a very, you know, um, safe plant to work with in, you know, specific ways, obviously not overdosing, but just if you follow the specific tradition of ingesting it. And um, it can be very, very powerful. So that's my favorite right now in cacao, mm. like you're drinking. <laughs> Hergon Sacha and cacao is just mm. delicious. Yeah. Tell me more about your relationship with cacao. Ooh, cacao. I love um, the tradition, the heart opening experience that it has. I love all the ritual behind it, the ancient rituals behind it, like from Mayans to all the way down to Central and South America. There's such deep history surrounding this magical tree. And I just, even when you just see the tree in the wild or wherever, you just see, it looks like an alien tree. You know, it just <laughs> looks like it's from some other planet. And just seeing these massively beautiful, colorful fruit just coming out of the trunk like that, it's just really really beautiful. It's very unusual. So I'm not surprised that it's been such a revered tree uh, loaded in spirit energy for a long time. Mm. I mean, revered as such, as like a spirit tree for a long time amongst many traditions. Such a powerful yeah, spirit. Course. Right. And it's just so delicious. I mean, and it's so interesting, you know, if you have it straight, it's so different than like how we see the modern day hot chocolate, you know, Oof, which yeah. I tell people all the time, cocoa, which I know some people use for raw cacao, but cocoa is not the real medicine. Like you have to get truly raw cacao unprocessed as much as possible. If you want this key chemistry that it has, which is where the spirit is infused, right? So right. it's just key. So to anybody listening, do not buy overly processed or Dutch processed cacao that is just basically burning the fantastic energy that it has. Right. And separating the powder from the butter, which, yeah. you know, working with the paste itself, which is a whole food product, 
is such a beautiful experience. And even just, you know, having a taste of it in your mouth, it's just, there's something about it that is so whole and pure that Mm -hmm. it is energetically, physically, spiritually, a whole different experience than something that's been kind of split up, separated, over-processed, packaged. And I'm so grateful that this tradition is being revived. And, you know, there's no surprise that cacao ceremony and cacao ritual is having such a revival in these past couple of years because we as humanity are standing in front of this choice of whether we're going to give into fear or we're going to step into love and lead from that place. And in my experience, cacao is such a powerful reminder to always drop back into love, even if it feels scary and there's lots of unknowns. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is so beautiful. It's so true. And I just love how the plant, you know, is so bitter in a way. When you have it raw, it's really bitter. And then the association to cacao is actually very sweet. Everybody thinks of chocolate, you know, like a delicious chocolate bar, which is also wonderful. But I think it's so important to connect to the energetics as aligned as they are to the actual tree as possible. Like if some, if you have the opportunity for that, it's really, really beautiful. And the paste is the closest you can get to that aligned, you know, uh, unless you're eating the fruit, obviously, but it's just beautiful to see that process. And also mm-hmm. the alchemy, you know, like from having the seeds, which are delicious to eat raw, to the fermenting process, which the whole alchemization of the taste and the, ch- and the transfer of taste to then making it into a paste, grounded, stone grounded, or however you source it. And it's just beautiful, the whole process. Like just the process in itself is a heart opening experience. Mm. Have you done that? A to Z? Yes. Wow. For sure. It's just amazing. And it's so, I love Mm -hmm. how sexual it is, you know, like it's like infused with that energy. You open the massive pot and it's just like this perfectly mandalic placed beans in a big like a big phallus inside of like yes. mother's vagina. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's just beautiful. Just the whole thing. It's just symbolically powerful. I remember yeah. riding my bike in Bali and everywhere I would see in every village, they would have cacao beans um, just laid out, drying out before they're processed. And amazing. Yeah. It's so cool. Bali was the place where I discovered ceremonial cacao and now it's just. Oh, such really? A, wow. Mm, yeah. Such a big guide and ally. Um, and speaking of energy and energetic beings, when did Anima Mundi as a being come to be in your experience and what did she tell you and how does she guide you? That's such an interesting question because at first, you know, I didn't treat it as a, as an energy or as an entity. In other words, I would just kind of be in survival mode, trying (laughs) to make everything happen at once. It wasn't all just, you know, magical from the inception. Of course, there's hard times as you have a business and there's great times when you land your dreams here and there, you know? So, but I think one friend asked me one day, she's like, she asked me to connect. She's a very beautiful, very, a psychic medium, actually. She's a very beautiful human being. And she was explaining what she saw as the entity of Anima Mundi once. And I was like, wow, you're right. It is an actual living being and it's controlling a lot of my life. (laughs) I was laughing in a good way, not in necessarily a bad way. So um, it was really beautiful to connect to that. And since then, which was around like three years ago, I started really understanding it as a personality outside of myself um, that I just really connect to in that way, like a separate entity. And I honestly don't see it as male or female, you know, it feels so um, connected to nature's mind. It's like so beyond uh, the division of what we experience in humanity, you know, like it's just, it feels so whole and one and coincidentally in a way or synchronistically, um, anima mundi means the world soul. So it really connects to that oneness of nature, you know, beyond gender, beyond anything. It's just everything. And, and I wish we didn't, I wish we had another word for it. You know, know, it's not really it, but the, the energy of that onenessness is just really beautiful. And that's what I connect to as an entity, as a, as a company. Mm. Yeah. Anytime I see yeah. deer in our backyard eating our apples or, you know, earth <laughs> apples that are not really ours or stewards anyway, I just can't call an animal it because it's a yeah. being and I totally hear what you're saying. And Anima Mundi is an expression of source itself. So it's so beyond Mm -hmm. what we can put into human words. Yeah. 
I feel that deeply. Yeah. Yeah, and I love uh, the deer expression. It's so true. I can never use the word it even to animals or even sometimes situations. Like you said, like the expression (laughs) of a situation oftentimes becomes like an entity, a living being, and it resembles the oneness of dual, the dual nature truly as a holistic expression, you know, she, him, whatever, uh, into one energy. So it's so true. Mm. You know, when you were speaking, I was very much that. Like we were yes. just saying, the two, the phallus and the vagina in one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. A medicine for today. It's interesting because often when we think of cacao, we think mama cacao and it's this feminine spirit. But now that you bring that up, I'm actually remembering that there's some cacao that I get that feels very feminine, but there's other types of cacao paste that feels very masculine. So what if I allow it to be the full spectrum of what it is instead of just having an expectation of it being mama? Yeah, that is so true. And I think the hard frequency is often associated to feminine, Mm -hmm. you know, because of the soft, gentle nature. But cacao also can be very heating, you know, in the sense of masculine energetics. You know, it can be very heating, very fiery. And I also feel like it can be very soothing and relaxing. And it has that dual nature chemically, you know, it can literally be delicious to go to sleep with. You know, I, I oftentimes drink cacao before bed. Most people, some people are like, I'm so sensitive. I'm never going to be able to do that. And some people are like, it knocks me out. And I think, you know, it ignites ne- different neurotransmitters in our body. And I do feel like it's somewhat adaptogenic in nature because it will express based on what you need in that moment. And I feel like that inherent intelligence in some plants is somewhat adaptogenic in the way that you never really know how it might just fuel you. Mm. oftentimes cacao has put me to sleep like immediately like I feel like my melatonin just like spikes and I just roll over (laughs) and go to sleep and then sometimes I'm just energized like if it's a cup of coffee or something but um but I think it's beautiful how it has that dual uh resemblance and it's so true sometimes it's so masculine and sometimes it's so feminine and how we experience cacao before bed I totally hear you for some people it might be too activating but I've experienced it mixed with Anima Mundi Blue Lotus. And uh, Blue Lotus is known to activate the dream world. And it is some of the trippiest experiences I've ever had in my life. Yeah, it's so true. Can you speak to the Blue Lotus yeah. magic and how it works? Yeah. So Blue Lotus also has that dual nature, which I'm like, I'm usually in like a hunt for herbs that do that, you know, but Blue Lotus has that both expression. It can be very euphoric or it can be very relaxing. And it also has the two different chemical constituents like alkaloids that activate or also kind of decompress. And again, like adaptogens, not that these are adaptogens, but it has that similar trait that it just makes you just feel what you need to feel in that moment. But also Blue Lotus, I mean, just even on like the doctrine of signatures, meaning the plant resembles what it does. When you look at the flower or you smell the flower, you immediately smell like chocolate, like it smells like cacao. And if you think about it, they grew, they grow in very similar climates. They can be like side by side in a pond with the tree growing with it. And so I do feel like that naturally too, like just on an environmental level, it's very easy and intuitive to connect them. They both smell like each other, like the cacao's floral and deep notes can be found in blue lotus. And then the alkaloids within both do similar things. They raise you or they relax you. And so I feel like they're just perfect partners. They're like perfectly chemical partners that I feel like there should be more studies on this. Um, but just just intuitively and medicinally speaking, they were combined. So Mayan medicine, actually, a lot of people think of Blue Lotus being associated only to Egypt, which there's huge amounts of information from Egypt. So maybe that's why. But there's some information to this day where you can see in a lot of the Egyptian carvings that they had the Nymphaea family species in their frescoes or paintings in their in their ruins. Mm. And so they were very much using the blue lotus within their traditions too. And as you know, Mayans have used cacao as one of the ofrendas offerings to the divine, to the gods. And it's like the ultimate expression of like gods embodied into a fruit within their mythological writings or literal writings. And so in their frescoes, you can even see how they have the bruise, like in these, like picheles, like, um, I don't know how to say it, like pitchers. Yeah, pitchers. And the blue lotus always around. So you know how they always did everything so symbolic. That clearly was 
made into both together. They knew something was going on in that parallel chemistry. They were very connected, obviously. And so I think they also uh, did those brews together. And as they're just, again, perfect chemical partners, they exalt each other. When I combine them, I feel very uh, psychically activated. My body just falls into position. My heart feels open. Even like my posture changes, my breathing changes. I feel like a beacon of light. <laughs> you know, I'm just wanting to be like connected and happy and but very relaxed at the same time, which is my mm-hmm. favorite state that like relaxed euphoria is just so exquisite. And I feel like it's like meditating in a bottle, you know, like you or in a cup, you just drink it and you feel that expression already, you know, like infused in your vehicle. So it's really beautiful. Imagine. And I love that you combine them. Of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I haven't done it in a while because I've been a little bit scared because my dreams feel active just being in nature. But this definitely mm-hmm. is coming up for a reason and I'm ready to work with it again. But you mentioned the word euphoria and you have a product um, that I've tried in a tonic form or elixir in the little mm-hmm. bottle, euphoria. And I've shared it with people and even people who don't work with plants or believe in the metaphysics very much, they take it and they're like, what is going on? I'm actually feeling happy. <laughs> it's one of those profoundly magical potions that works right away. What are some of the active ingredients in it and how was that born? I love that. So it's born from also a South and Central American inspired plants. So it has um, mutapuama, which is a native to the Amazon, a beautiful plant that's also very opening and, and uses an aphrodisiac. Actually, it's even sold like in pills. If you go to Brazil, it's like mutapuama pills are kind of like even classics that you just kind of buy. Um, it has damiana, of course, which is native to Central America, also very much used in Mayan traditions with cacao. So damiana is another ally that is often very a perfect partner chemically with cacao. And with blue lotus, I mean, when I combine Damiana and blue lotus, I feel fantastic. It's like my, for days that I'm not feeling kind of so good and there's a never ending to-do list. Those are like my go-tos to kind of curve it out (laughs) and feel good. It also has, uh, it had Yohimbe, which is native to Africa, but it grows in the Amazon as well. We had to sadly take that out actually, because just recently, because of the regulations on plants right now, uh, Yohimbe is like now forbidden in Europe which is so sad, which is where Viagra comes from, by the way, a little side note. Hmm. Um, And so it's just really sad to see some classic, wonderful plants being banned. It's now being regulated by the FDA too. So anyways, we stopped working with that, but that's a very awakening and exquisite tonic. It also has Guarana, which is extremely activating and, you know, it's like a happy booster, but very energizing. Also, Guarana is like a kitchen staple in all of South America. Um, with acai very much yeah acai delicious um maca is actually used very much interchangeably with guarana or together and it creates a really nice beverage but maca is not in it and of course hibiscus a little bit of shizandra which is also very stimulating to the reproductive organs um and to our blood which is so important so i feel like when you have aphrodisiacs pairing them with blood herbs or blood boosting herbs kind of gives that rise of energy or that clearance and that opening. And I think that's about it. I don't think I'm missing. Oh yeah, Catuaba. How did I miss Catuaba? It's one of my favorites. Another beautiful tree. The inner bark is cultivated and used as an aphrodisiac for since millennia. That one is very steeped in tradition and it's extremely effective. It's even used for like erectile dysfunction. It's used with anagorasmia, people that have difficulty in orgasming. So you have a simple bark tea. You can even have it on its own and it will most likely work out in your benefit if you have that kind of issue. Or I even love to use it for people that have like serious performance anxiety on whatever level, whether it's during sexual intercourse or just speaking on stage or whatever. Uh, It kind of curves that anxiety and it just makes you kind of flow a little more and relax a little more in your body. So Katuawa is beautiful as well. Mm. So yeah, but we just launched the powder, which is very desired. People that don't like to use alcohol tinctures or extracts. So the powder is very effective. We didn't want to dilute it too much with delicious flavors, like, you know, too much of hibiscus or rose even because we wanted the medicine to be powerful. So you can concoct in whatever way you want, which is kind of like the basis of our medicines. We make it too much of like a prepared, ready to go, let's say cacao or matcha beverage. You kind of lose the potency. So 
we love to keep it potent and then anybody can just direct it into whatever direction they like within their own everyday ritual. How would you mix so, euphoria? What are some suggested flavors it pairs well with? Um, I would say any kind of hibiscus flavors, rose. I love doing like a rose milk with it. So if you do just infuse it with warm water, never boiling water, just warm water with the rose and adding it with some milk. It's just so good. You can have it just like mm -hmm. as a chilled milk or warm, like latte style. Um, you can even do desserts with it. I would say like from cookies to we even recently shared a raw vegan snicker bar with the euphoria. <laughs> So wow. for those of you that love to, you know, kick it up in the kitchen, that's a really nice dessert mm. to make. Um, even in chia pudding, I added even to chia puddings and functional foods, power balls. Ooh, chia pudding has been a huge staple for me now. I just make a couple of jars for the week and I eat it as dessert Whoa. at night often. And I love that mm -hmm. idea because I've been seeking something to add a little bit of flavor and color and interest to just, you know, pure coconut milk and chia. And I love that idea. Thank you. And That's awesome. speaking of your yeah. recipes and that Snickers recipe, Anima Mundi Instagram and recipes is just a whole world of its own that is so beautiful Yay. and so rich. Yay. How did the digital version of the being that is Anima Mundi come to be and develop and become the force that it is now? I've seen you really grow so much, I think, especially in the past year or so. What do you feel has shifted? Um, I think, yeah, just sharing recipes. We work with wonderful food foodies and chefs and amazing photographer ladies. And they just like, we kind of like do styling via WhatsApp or even <laughs> over the computer, or we even talk about recipes and create things together. And they just have the beautiful talent of photographing it to perfection. Like, I wish I had that talent, but it's so fun to be able to just, like express a recipe and collaborate on it, even if it's through digital ways. And then sharing it on Instagram for all anyone that likes to get creative. So yeah, this past year has been wild. I feel like since COVID kind of happened, which is almost two years, which is kind of crazy. Um, I feel like people just really wanted to start taking care of their immune system and their health with plants. Regard again, regardless of medical decisions, it's such a sustainable form of staying healthy and keeping your immune system in adaptability, you know, and constant resilience. And it's just so beautiful because it ritualizes your life. It adds extra amazing chemistry to your everyday foods, which is so important now with the current state of agriculture, you know, even if you're eating organic, a lot of these plants are very depleted, you know, so we kind of like need to like increase the, let's say the texture or the microbiome's capacity to test new things in the gut to literally create a better immune response and just feeling naturally healthier. It's so key. Like if I just stick to eating whatever is available in a supermarket and not going out of my way to increase, you know, different flavors and things and different things, or even seasonally, I feel like I don't feel that great. I feel like my body doesn't feel like it can adapt to the current situation. Well, whether it's microbiologically or just literally mentally, I feel like this constant addition of ingredients that can be truly sustainable to your diet can be one, a wonderful way to just staying healthy and strong, you know? So I really recommend herbs in that way. And you can work very locally too. It doesn't have to be herbs that are flown in from the other side of the world. If that's not what you agree with and really work with local plants that are like hard to find, you know, like go wildcrafting or talk to farmers if they have extra special things they don't like bring into their baskets and, you know, get used to eating more dandelion green salads or chickweed or whatever, whatever inspires you, you know, this everywhere in the world has its own set of plants, seasonal plants. And I think it's so key to go beyond whatever is offered in a supermarket because mm. supermarket to begin with is mostly not seasonal either, you know? So the supermarket mentality is very comfortable. You know, it's, I love it, you know, being able to buy an oil from who knows where and, you know, all these different things. But I feel like on a fresh level, like in ingre fresh ingredients and fresh herbs is so key to assisting that like resilience in that process. Yeah, I've seen you yeah. speak to the power of having your own garden as an act towards health and well-being. And that is definitely something that seems so simple, but it makes such a difference to eat something that we've grown ourselves. And also learning about the herbs around us, you know, 
always inspired by people around me who are mycologists and herbalists and guides who take people on walks. We actually just went on a mushroom walk last weekend and that made my life. Meeting someone who's so passionate about it, learning about the different plants and, you know, all kinds of things, not just mushrooms in the area. And I remember in the beginning, you mentioned that there were particular rituals and traditions and plants in North America that really were speaking to you. What were some of them? And if there's something particularly in the Northeast, I would love to know. Mm -hmm. You know, just to go with one very popular plant right now is echinacea. And so echinacea, Native Americans actually, for, for recorded uses of what they, how they used it, was not oh. even used as an immune booster. It was used as a pain reliever. Isn't that interesting? Mm. So they would create these teas from the flower tops, from the leaves, and of course the roots, but like flower tops were very often used as well, um, which is not what we traditionally find in most, let's say, echinacea syrups and so on the market that's more root-based, which is very powerful and wonderful, but... The flower tops is also a very sustainable way of using echinacea, which Native Americans used to do all the time for like any kind of pain relief and for strengthening. So that's just one example of like a plant that we can start using in a different way. And it would be so much more sustainable in that way too. Like there's so many herb growers that just grow for the roots and the leaves would be such a wonderful way to have a natural immune boosting tea, which is inspired on a Native American tradition. Uh, to to kind of keep your upgraded immune response, you know? So that's just one way. And it's not just for immunity, it's just for pain relief. Mm. And there's so many, oh my goodness. There's a lot of the classic herbs that we find nowadays derive from traditions in North America. And of course, a lot of them come from Europe that were adapted as soon as the whole European presence became to be and seeds coming in and taking over. Um, but yeah, there's so many. Which one is one of your favorite herbs that is local to you right now in the Northeast? Mm, that is a great question. You know, I'm so taken by mushrooms and learning about them. We There was a dead cherry tree that we uh, brought down from the top of our property last year. And just yesterday, I noticed that there's tur what, something that looks like turkey tail. I'm pretty sure it's turkey tail that's growing on those logs. and. I couldn't believe it because, you know, talk about local. This is from this property that we're stewards of, a mushroom that I just learned how to identify. And maybe the next step will be to learn how to forage and process and make tea or tincture, whatever that is. But mushrooms is something that I am endlessly fascinated by and wanting to learn more about and commune with, whether that's actually picking them and ingesting them or just admiring the beans that they are and the wisdom that they carry. Mm -hmm. Have you considered growing your own, even if it's oysters or so I've done fun? that? Yes. Eric, at some point one year, he gave me a gift of um, a couple of those, you know, logs that you grow at home back when we were living in Brooklyn. So we grew oysters, we grew lion's mane. And Amazing. it was it was fantastic. You know, I have some actually some time lapses that I never posted. I want to dig those up because just the changes yes. that happened to them within like a night and then getting to eat them. I almost didn't want to eat them because they, I felt like they had become my friends, you know, and I'm not even plant-based. I eat animals, but when you grow it yourself and you build that relationship and you witness its expansion, it's, it feels like a different thing. It's so true. It's like, and it's also the glory of like seeing it grow. And then you're like, oh, I don't want to cut it off, you know, yes. and yes. eat it. But then Lion's life goes on. Favorites. Yeah. So delicious. It's mm -hmm. just really amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We just started growing here cordyceps in Costa Rica. Ooh. And it's kind of revolutionary for this climate too. And I mean, I don't think anyone's ever grown cordyceps in Costa Rica either. Wait, cordyceps, there's in the wild, of course. They grow out of the bugs. How do you grow them? Not with that. Well, there's two ways. So the cordyceps militaris has become like the new popular cordyceps because it has a fruiting body and you can grow, let's say, in like farm style or lab style. The cordyceps sinensis, which is the one that is the bug one that most people have seen videos of. And it's like crazy videos of the cordyceps taking over like the whole bug or the bug's head and shooting forth. So you can still find a lot, a lot of the sinensis wild. Obviously, it's very hard. And let's say Tibet and different parts of Asia but it's so expensive and it's very, very, very hard to get, which it should be, you know, it's kind of like amazing to find a cordyceps in the wild, you know, it's just 
the sinensis. So a lot of the sinensis you see nowadays that is grown in laboratories, it doesn't even test as sinensis. Mm. It shows up as a different mushroom because it's not even able to not be wildcrafted. Wow. The true sinensis by nature has to be wildcrafted. So, and there's all sorts of cordyceps, you know, the ones that grow out of bugs are not all edible. Some of them are supposedly poisonous. And so it's very hard to know which one is a true one you can eat. But militaris, for, for anyone that's like strictly vegan, that was with a one similar chemical constituents as a sinensis is the militaris. So I really mm. recommend that one. That's the one we use and grow with our mushroom farmer for our company. And I just love it because it's so much easier to grow. And that's the one we're growing here. The sinensis never gets a, or the sinensis in the sense of the cultivated one, never even gets a fruiting body. It's just strictly mycelium. Mm. So not that it's necessarily bad. I mean, the whole mycelium can be cultivated in its peak and it's shown to be very effective and has enough polysaccharides and all the great beta-glucans that everybody's after for. But it is not the fruiting body version. So yeah, it's some people don't like it for that reason. That is mm. just strictly mycelium um, mm. for the cultivated sinensis. Fascinating. Yeah, yeah so, but militaris is great and it's sustainable and you get, it's a beautiful mushroom. It's like orange fingers that mm -hmm. grow like this. And, and that's the one we saw growing here and it was just amazing. I mean, I didn't grow it alone. There's a mushroom guy here on our mountain and he's just a genius. So I just mm -hmm. brought the babies and he was the midwife and it was wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. That is so cool. So you know, you mentioned some of the growers that you work with and supporting indigenous traditions. And on this podcast, one of the inspirations for it is to have conversations about expanded consciousness and conscious entrepreneurship. And I think one of the most important things to bring into the conversation is that conscious entrepreneurship is going to look different for everyone. And the most important invitation is to listen to the whispers that each human being is hearing and implementing that. So for you, it looks like Anima Mundi right now. And by doing so, you are providing an opportunity to so many people to support and vote with their dollar to support those wild crafting, indigenous, beautiful healing traditions. And as you've mentioned, being an entrepreneur and you know having a factory and a supply chain and having to deal with the FDA and also managing the food styling and the recipes, there's so many different moving pieces. And you've mentioned sometimes it's super fun and you're achieving your dreams and sometimes it's really hard. What have been some of the times when it's been hard and what keeps you going? I think the hard times is when you're just too, there's too much on the plate, you know, like you just said, there's, you know, as, as an owner, you have your hands in everything and it's just, it gets tiring, you know, even if you have a great team and managers under you, there's still the touch that you want to do in your own way, of course, as a, let's say as the chef in your own kitchen kind of thing. So I think it gets overwhelming when you have to like think of taxes and then you have to finalize the FDA inspection. And then you have to like tell the photographer, no, you wanted the, the dusted <laughs> powder in a certain way and, or just the recipe in whatever way or, you know, working and just constantly in communication, you know, like I feel like thank God for technology that we have all these avenues to communicate efficiently that we can just do so much at one time, which also is a double-edged sword. You know, we have like back in the day, this was not even possible, you know, and, and that's kind of like prevented a whole series of stress the way we manage it now with like the fast pacedness of everything, no matter where you live, if you're plugged into this matrix of like answering phone calls, sending emails, texting, social media, Zoom calls, Whatever it is, like it's just, there's so much that can be put into a day that it can fry your nervous system. And so to me, like there's so many times that I just felt fried. You know, I was just like, I, I took on teaching here and there sometimes with the Shift Network last year. And like that just added like the cherry on top to my plate that I was just like, wow, there's too much going on. And as something that I constantly advise myself to do is like to only take on certain things at a time, you know, like everything is meant to happen as it's meant to happen and just be very selective with your energy. What do you really want to accomplish? Because once you really align to the vision of what you want to manifest, it will come to you very fast. If you're doing, let's say the formula of manifestation, which is a full embodied empowered, yes. And then visualizing it to come to you and there's a lot of people talking about that in the internet. It's fascinating because it really freaking works. And so if you're a powerful manifester, still take it easy, you know, like just 
take on projects and be very selective with your energy, really focus your mastery to the fullest in one particular thing at a time, which for me, it's so hard. I sometimes want to say yes to everything. And then I'm like, you know, dead on the bed without able to do anything sometimes, you know, and I'm just like, why did I take all this on? You know? So I think, you know, it's, it's very important to self-care and for me, it's been very hard to take care of myself. I love taking care of others. I love making food, hosting people or friends or saying yes to a million projects. And then I get left out and I forget to even include myself into the equation. So those have, those have been moments that once my nervous system is borderline burning out, I was like, okay, this is too much. Reset, go unplug, go in the forest a few days with no technology. Don't turn on any social media. And really, because it's an addiction, you know, I, like I sometimes I'm addicted to even working and making things happen. And then I'm like, no, 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 it's just this is all, you know, it's going to kill you. And what are you going to do if your creative reserves run out, you know, so my favorite way is, you know, really sticking to meditation every day, no matter what, even if I'm like crawling, like in death to not do it. And some days I just really don't want to do anything. And I still force myself to go down to by the river that's near our house and just like, just sit in peace or wherever you are, just sit in peace and silence and, and then doing some sort of movement, exercise, walking. Um, I also think uh, ways that have saved my sanity is doing subconscious reprogramming, which I really recommend for anyone running a lot of stress. There is really wonderful meditations from like, Dr. Joe Dispenza to Bruce Lipton and the classic, you know, uh, very famous guys that are coming out with neurobiology and all this stuff. But and listening, like being able to really reprogram stories and ideas and drives that are necessarily like killing you, even if it's a good thing, just like really stepping it down and like eliminating any baggage that's within your field. I think it's really important. Um, that has been lifesaver for me. But you know, it's really hard. And, and sometimes also as a business, like when you're investing, like we've never had any investors, I've started everything from the ground up and I've, I don't even care to have investors necessarily or expand and being a huge empire or whatever. Like, no, I think it's really beautiful to stay artisan and, you know, being that fine wine and being very selective again with what you choose and not spreading yourself too thin. And, and that can be hard too, when you're just your soul advisor and investor and everything, it can be also draining. And I know a lot of entrepreneurs deal with that, you know? So again, going back to that self-care and taking care of yourself brings that renewed energy and clarity on what to do next and how to invest your time, your money, your energy, your whatever into next, you know? So, mm. so yeah, I don't know if that really answered the question, but it's a little bit <laughs> all over the place. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, what I'm hearing is that committing to connecting with the divine and committing mm -hmm. to constantly connecting with the why of what you're doing so that that's what drives you in your actions and that allows you to have the spaciousness to make the decisions that are in alignment with your vision instead of getting busy with just daily tasks and busy work mm -hmm. yeah busyness the glorification of busyness is not necessarily a good thing you know, I think being excessively busy and putting a million things on your plate is not a sign of success either. I think it's also very important to be selective and knowing that that will bring you the greatest harvest in whatever you're being selective with, you know. Mm. You mentioned, mm. you know, the need to sometimes totally unplug, go into the forest and take a digital break. How does, what does your boundaries with social media look like on a daily basis? I set timers. You know how the phone, you can put timers on how much time you've spent on something. I set timers mm -hmm. to remind me that I've spent already an X amount of time uh, doing something already. So let's say if it's endlessly scrolling on Instagram, because that happens so often too. Like when you feel tired, I've noticed this in myself and a lot of people, you sometimes just go into the wormhole of social media and you're clicking from page to page to page. And sometimes I do that when like, I'm like half brain dead from being so busy at something. And then I'm not even realizing that I'm spending my sacred time from already busyness into just scrolling into like an elusive reality, truly, you know? So that's when I like don't allow myself to go. When I've had really busy days, I don't allow, I don't even put lights on. I put candles on 
I don't even want to see light. I get so sensitive to just even having light bulbs on. Mm -hmm. I like to be in darkness, especially at the end of the day after a very stressful day. Turn off all the lights, light a million candles, make your delicious cacao or potion of choice, sit, read a book under candlelight, not even a bright light, just read book with candles. You know, even slightly straining the eye sometimes can be really good here and there, you know, not being so used to this brightness all the time. So I think that also is a form of technology that's good to unplug from. Like mm -hmm. even when I go to the forest, I love doing these adventures where you can just go in, have very little resources, like literally water and food and a sweater and maybe a notepad <laughs> with some fun little place you can write your downloads with. And you just go and just unplug for as many days as you can, even if it's overnight and camping mm -hmm. in nature or sleeping on the ground with, you know, just a pillow on the ground and a blanket and just very minimal and connecting and grounding. It's really powerful. Like what happens in those nights is just, it brings up a whole set of beauty in your life, you know? Mm -hmm. So I really recommend that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just a reminder that the information is always there. It's just that we're not always available to receive it. And I know I have to let you go back to your babes and your biz. So I have a couple of wrap up questions to drop into some of the things that we've opened up here so powerfully. The first one is funded by source. You know, you've mentioned you've not taken outside funding and you've really connected to keeping it artisanal. Um, and I'm curious, what is your experience of being funded by source and how have you? built this empire from the financial standpoint with the source co-creating with Anima Mundi. Well, I love that name, by the way, funded by source. That's so beautiful. Um, I think, you know, going that's, I feel like money is just a mirror of, let's say an abundance you're looking to draw in, you know, it's to me, money has never meant a lot. Like I could have a lot of money and it just sometimes I don't do anything with it. I don't even buy myself a lot of things. Like I'm a very minimal person. I hardly own things. And even my husband always tells me like, enjoy, like celebrate your abundance sometimes. And I'm just like, I don't even know in what I just want to go like to the garden <laughs> and wear my same old clothes every day, you know, like, or whatever. But just, I think money can be a symbol of like, you're perhaps just receiving an abundance to being aligned to your mission. You know, if you feel like, let's say you're constantly working towards something, and it's just not flowing and you're wasting your resources, then that perhaps is a sign that you need to twitch your vision a little to find it into the right alignment to really follow what you need to do. So I just see it as like a sacred mirror. I don't see it necessarily as like the greatest accomplishment, you know? Um, and of course, money is wonderful to have. Like, it's just a great confirmation. Um, it's not necessary. I know a lot of communities that live without money completely and they live and thrive in a beautiful way and that can happen too you know maybe that's what the future of some economies will be you know which i think is incredible but um funded by source i feel like once i just kept following the call of different things whether it's product developments or strategic alliances and really like i was saying focusing on and strategizing on what people and places and situations synchronize with you is a way that I feel like abundance flows, you know, like really work with what's on your path, work with the current resources and make the best of it, you know, and really refine, fine tune it to like keep getting from the well in a way, you know? So mm -hmm. I think that's great mm -hmm. going beyond what you already have and going to like the grass is greener mentality. I feel it can be depleting and it won't be necessarily funded by source. You know, it will be the mind in like a rat race, which, mm -hmm. I feel like disenables a certain magic and abundance when it's in that form and that powered in that way. So, so yeah, that's how mm. I've seen it. Just following the synchronistic and strategic alliances mm. that just flow with you, you know, you know, the funded by source term comes from my teacher, Michelle Sine. And one of the ways that I see it is exactly how you brought it up. And it's this invitation to notice abundance in all forms. So you know, when you are successful in something and money flows in, it doesn't mean that to celebrate it, we need to go and spend that money. We can celebrate mm -hmm. it by going and noticing a flower that just blossomed in our garden and noticing that as abundance and being grateful for that. I think that's such a beautiful invitation to reframe abundance. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's what that was one of the blessings of COVID. You know, people that had, let's say, savings 
or they just had money sitting somewhere and they didn't know what to do with it and it was or doing their first big investment or whatever it is, regardless of the amount of money it is, I feel like it really put life into perspective of like, what's really important for me right now? Mm. You know, like, what do I need to do? Like, I saw so many people here moving to Costa Rica, like buying their dream piece of land, finally, because they've been holding off, doubting if that was the right decision. Mm. You know, and I think following that flow and in that intuitive response is so vital to generating abundance, stepping into the unknown and following that little hit that says, God, I would love to own that piece of land, or I would love to buy this cabin in the middle of the woods or whatever it is that I feel like that propels that like spontaneous um, enthusiasm that propels greater abundance the majority of the time, obviously not always, but um, I think that's really beautiful to see people buying like actual physical assets, you know, being like, I'm going to finally give myself this one thing I've always dreamed of, you know? So I think that's one of the blessings of COVID. For people that have been able to do that, I think that's great. Or doing major life changes that are also a form of abundance, shifting into that new mm-hmm. energy. I see it as an abundance as well. You know, having that clarity of like, it's time for me to leave the city or it's time for me to move a different place and so on. So. When do you feel the most connected to the divine? At 5.15 in the morning. <laughs> no, I'm joking. No, but truly in the morning my favorite uh, time to connect where I just feel like the veils are thin and I feel it strongly is when I feel the divine. When I do that meditation and do it when I'm like half asleep is my favorite time and the most profound time for me specifically. Mm. Yeah. How about you? When is As I ask you that question, Eric came to my office door, like trying to wave at me and get my attention. And I, I saw that as a sign. He's definitely one of the most powerful portals and invitations into divine that source gave me. Uh, sometimes it's really triggering and uncomfortable. And sometimes when I allow myself to just get past my own ego and judgments and fears, it's pure love. And it's so beautiful. And, you know, making him a cup of cacao while he's super busy on phone calls all day and knowing that even though we don't get to sit every time and have this beautiful ritual around fire, that that plant is working with him while it's working with me and, you know, yeah, co-creation. That's when I feel the most connected to the divine. Oh, that's beautiful. And you both emit such a sacred partnership and Mm. that's such a beautiful abundance right there to Mm. find that within the other Mm. and really utilizing that for your growth mutually. You know, it's beautiful. And you were one of to see that and amplify that by inviting us to host the crystal workshop at Anima Mundi. It was one of our first, if not the first appearances as a couple, you know, offering this work in the world. And it was so, it was definitely a defining moment in my life. So thank you. Oh, that's beautiful. I would love to see you guys there again soon. Truly. I would too. Planting the seed. And my final question to you, even though I could talk to you forever is, um, Adriana, you nourish so many through the recipes, through the products, through the herbs. How can people who feel moved by your message and the beautiful work that you do in the world, how can they nourish you? Oh, that's so beautiful. I think seeing like what you're saying, you know, like what you said, that you still feel that beautiful magic and, and, really receiving the product as it, what it, what it truly wants to stand for. I really genuinely appreciate that. Um, that reciprocity, that kindness of really reflecting and being like, wow, this is infused in magic. That truly is one of the most heartwarming things for me as, as we work tirelessly to fulfill this vision and this amazing mission in, in general. So thank you receiving reflections like that and the kindness through social media, which I know can sometimes be very hard to see nowadays. Everybody's, you know, a little aggressive or edgy, not everybody, but there's a good amount of, you know, intensity that we come across even through social channels that that simple kindness is the tr- one of my favorite forms of nourishment and connection, mm. you know, that reciprocity, like we were just saying. Mm. Yeah. So thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for doing what you do for this conversation. And before we wrap up, is there anything I didn't ask you about that you feel called to share? Um, I feel like that was very complete. Your questions have been beautiful. I love mm-hmm. that we navigated every little sector from business to metaphysical goodness. 
Thank you. And thank you for being that wellspring and that connection of those two worlds or many worlds, I should say, Mm. of just spirituality and then the reality of life and social media and entrepreneurship and beyond. So Mm. thank you. You're Mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. Mirror, mirror, sister. Thank you so much. This is beautiful. And I will seeds planted to see each other in person. And I would love to give you a hug and share a cup of cacao with Damiana, maybe Blue Lotus. We'll see whatever herbs show up. Yes. That sounds fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Blessings.